Welcome. We're the Cliff family, and I'm Adam. I'm Eileen. I'm Ava. I'm Emma. And we'd like to welcome you to Fairmont Avenue United Methodist Church. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Ashton Horsley, Director of Children's Ministries. And in this week's children's sermon, I would love for all of our young people to play Would You Rather with me and to think about the most important decision that we will make in our faith. The children's sermon is posted to Fairmount Avenue United Methodist Church's YouTube channel. Good morning. Welcome to Fairmount Avenue United Methodist Church online worship. I'm Pastor Shauna, and I wanna welcome you to worship today on this second Sunday of Lent. As we gather in the places that we are, we uh, recognize that uh, on this day, we would love to be together, but please know that we are together in spirit uh, as we worship in our homes. On our website, you can find a worship guide with liturgy and uh, hymns for this morning's worship service. Also know on our website, there's a ton of information about things happening this Lent, from uh, Lent book study to uh, devotions that you can do at home uh, to other events that are happening uh, in this season. And so from my heart to your heart, let us worship together. May the blessing of God give us strength for the journey. May the spirit of wisdom give us vision for the road. May the love of Christ make us caring companions as together we go forth from this place. And so over Lent, uh, as we are on our own Lenten journey and, and thinking more deeply about love, Ashton, our children's ministry director, is challenging our young people, our kiddos, to think about who Jesus is and who Jesus is to each of us. And so she's been asking this question, who is Jesus? And every week we'll be featuring some of their answers and responses to that question uh, as we learn to listen from the wisdom and curiosity of our kiddos. That's our God. God. That he loves us too. And he watches over us. Oh, 
And so now, won't you please join me in prayer? Holy God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for warmer air and sunshine and the hope of spring. God, we give thanks for this community that supports and, and uplifts and holds one another. God, we give thanks for the ways that you pour love into us, whispering to our very spirits when we don't even know what it is we should pray. And so, holy God, for those who are grieving today, we pray for your peace. For those who are holding uh, a physical struggle in their body or a mental health struggle, and, and whether it's disease or illness or, um, or the virus or, or uh, addiction, God, we pray for mercy and for relief. For those who are struggling under continued isolation and loneliness, we pray for connection and community. And God, for uh, the ways in which you are pouring out mercy into the world right now through the vaccine distribution and, and the thought and hope of things opening up, we give thanks. God, we pray that you would instill in us a patient spirit as we wait for the next steps of, of this pandemic living anticipating resurrection and new life on the other side. God, we pray for our leaders and, and school administrators and, and politicians and, and community organizers who are making decisions uh, about how to best um, respond to the pandemic in a safe way. And, and God, we pray for our city, our cities, with the upcoming trial in Minneapolis, of the police officers and, and specifically of, of Chauvin's trial that is coming up, God, after the murder of George Floyd, we pray for uh, inspiration, for a call to action, and for justice. God, we pray that that justice wouldn't just happen in our, our legal systems, but would happen in our own hearts and minds as we consider how we might be a more anti-racist church, that we might confront our own biases that are present in our, in our own minds and hearts and bodies, and that you might call us into a more loving way of walking on this earth. That collectively we might love others better. And so now we pray as your son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This is a reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. Then he began to teach them, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. I was reminded uh, by Facebook that this week, two years ago, our denomination, the, the Global Connection of the United Methodist Church, had a special session of the General Conference uh, to talk about matters around human sexuality. And, and it was extremely hurtful and harmful and painful um, 
as we, we watched our global denomination choose exclusion over inclusion, judgment over dignity, hate over love. I've been watching uh, some really great TV lately. Uh, I've been watching the Billy. Ho I watched the Billy Holiday movie, um, and Judas and the Black Messiah, and the PBS documentary on the Black Church, and and all of this together as it as it has come together has reminded me that our world, our country, our churches are still very broken, uh, and have so much repentance and reparation left to do. And this is important because we have come through an incredible year, right? Um, where we have continued to see how these same struggles, these same questions over inclusion and exclusion, equity and justice permeate our society and the narratives of our lives. In this last week, uh, I have seen how systems can fail personally, um, and I've had to advocate for system change. I've seen how the anxiety and the weight of the pandemic can, can press in on every single side. And I've watched, as I have, as I have seen our cities embrace for the trial of the police officers that killed George Floyd, and it feels like the very notion of equity is holding its breath for justice. And there's this fear to exhale uh, for fear that it may not return again. I have seen uh, this week the grief of a childhood friend as her father passed away, um, my neighbor across the street growing up, uh, the pastor of a Church of God in Christ church uh, the same denomination as St. Albans Church of God in Christ, who are our partners in ministry. And, and this pastor across the street, uh, Pastor Beats, and his wife, Evangelist Beats, were influential uh, in their passion for Jesus. Ironically, that same day, I was part taking part of a, a pilot group that is looking at how to... Um, increase anti-racism training in our Minnesota Annual Conference of the Methodist Church. And in that meeting, we were asked a question of, of what do you think of when you think of the image of Jesus? Or what were your first images of Jesus that have come to mind? And, and I didn't grow up in a church setting, so I didn't have a picture of, of who Jesus was, but I heard a voice, two voices. Pastor Beats and his wife, Evangelist Beats. I could hear the word Jesus coming out of their mouths. And it was ironic because that was the same day that he passed away. The testimony of Jesus permeating from the mouths of our neighbors have sat with me and carried me all of these years. In today's scripture, I am reminded that really none of this, of course, is new. It's not new for this century, this generation, for our lifetime, for the generations before, since even before Jesus, people have been putting their whole selves on the line for the sake of the gospel. This path of love, this, this self-sacrificial path of love, this, this path of love that requires our whole bodies to show up our whole minds to show up, our whole soul to show up, to build a more healed, more whole, more just, and more sustainable world. In today's scripture, I am reminded that um, we are called to take up our cross. Take up your cross, Jesus says, and follow me. Now that's heavy. That's a heavy thing for Jesus to say. But I hope you also hear it as hopeful because we know that Jesus' life was not defined by the cross, rather by, rather by resurrection. Cro the cross was just part of the path to get there. Jesus had victory over the struggle. The cross was worth picking up. Jesus was in a battle for the mind. Uh, he was also in a battle for the soul, and he bore it with his whole body. He knew that uh, 
what his work was doing, that his, his activism, his teaching, his preaching, his organizing, his, his healing was creating a, a new vision of what the world could be. It was putting an energy out into the world that was inspiring others. He was empowering people who had been told that they were powerless. He was lifting up the brokenhearted, the disenfranchised, the poor, the sick, the stranger, the women. Jesus was, was teaching the good news that God loves all people. And Jesus knew that if he was going to show those without power how to claim their, their God-instituted power, those who already had positions of authority were not going to give it up easily. So in this conversation, Jesus is preparing his disciples with mental fortitude to be able to do the work that lay ahead through the challenges that were coming. Our Lent challenge this week is to love your mind. Love your mind. And this idea of, of letting love rule your mind. It requires a sense of self-discipline and order uh, that, that is a continual renewing, as Paul put it, in your mind. To put the thought of God at the front of everything that you think and do. Take up your cross, Jesus says, and follow me. And we know that Jesus' life was not defined by the cross, rather by resurrection, there is victory over this struggle. The cross is worth picking up. The way of Jesus is not easy. It is going to cost you something. In fact, it might even cost you everything. Jesus reprimands Peter. You do not have the, the, in mind the concerns of God, rather human concerns. And, and what does it mean really to have the mind of God to be focused on the things that God cares about? Well, Jesus tells us in, in his whole life and ministry and teaching that, that ordering your whole life, not for yourself, but for the kingdom of God, for God's vision of this world, takes work. It takes intention. And so what does this vision look like or what does the kingdom of God look like? Well, according to Jesus, it's a, a world that provides access to healing for all who need healing. It's a world that speaks love instead of hate. It's a world that prioritizes people over profit. It's a world that doesn't try to argue their way out of doing the good, but just does the good. It's a world that seeks wholeness across every part of society from the disenfranchised Samaritan woman at the well to the Pharisees and scribes who ask questions. It's an invitation for the sinner and the saintly. It's an open door and open arm and open heart. And Jesus is real clear about this. It is going to cost us something. For the rich young ruler, it cost him his fortune his personal security and plans. For the grieving son, it was giving up the funeral plans for his father. For the woman at the well, it was giving up the, the social norms and, and the fear of talking to a Jewish man. For the Pharisees and the religious leaders, it was about giving up power and self-righteousness. For the disciples, for the 12, it was about giving up their very lives their jobs, their plans, their hope for a future, uh, living quiet lives by the sea, in exchange for following Jesus into a new world that they would create together. Take, take up your cross, Jesus says, and follow me. And because we know that Jesus' life is not defined by the cross, rather by resurrection. We know there is victory over the struggle, and that cross is worth picking up. The work of following Jesus, however, isn't safe. The very nature of the cross is not a safe endeavor. And before you start to get it twisted, the work of Jesus wouldn't be storming the capital with guns and violence. Jesus was all the way to the end, a pacifist. 
Peter wanted to, to fight his way out when, when Jesus is being carried away by soldiers and Jesus said, no, put your sword away, Peter. Jesus was a pacifist even to the point of his own death. Jesus wouldn't be linking nationalism with godliness. Jesus envisioned a kingdom that, that superseded the structures of this world, a kingdom that was in the heart of his followers. Jesus' revolution was, was not about overturning power structures simply to replace them with something new. No, Jesus' revolution was about something bigger, longer lasting. It was about renewing the hearts and minds of all people. So that God's people, whatever they saw injustice, a need in their community, or a need for community, God's beloved community would know instantly and do something about it. Jesus wasn't interested in, in the here and now. Jesus was interested in the forever. Changing the world generation after generation. Jesus challenged authority, but that wasn't all that Jesus did. Jesus redistributed wealth, but that wasn't all that Jesus did. Jesus healed the sick, but that wasn't all that Jesus did. Jesus listened to the outcast, but that wasn't all that Jesus did. Jesus centered marginalized voices and struggles, but that wasn't all that Jesus did. Jesus gave his whole life, his whole being, his whole self to make the world a better place, a more healed, more whole, more just, more equitable, more sustainable place. And he made sure that his followers did the same. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Take up your cross, Jesus says. Follow me. And because we know that Jesus' life is not defined by the cross, but by resurrection, we know there is victory over the struggle, and that cross is worth picking up. There's also something interesting in what Jesus says. He doesn't say, take up my cross. In fact, what he's teaching his disciples is that they are not going to walk the way of his cross. He tells them to take up their cross. We don't die Jesus' death. We are called to a death of self so that we might embrace God's calling on our lives. That Jesus' way might become our way. For me, that meant vocational ministry. For you, that might mean changing the public school system or the school that you work in. It might mean standing alongside the child who's always in trouble or the parent who is always late or the teacher who's always at their end. Because a person in need doesn't always uh, present as weak. Sometimes they present as angry or short-tempered or impatient. And your cross might be loving that person. For you, that might mean challenging the bank that you work in, helping your colleagues rethink an economy so that it works for more people. For you, it might mean uh, if you're working a, a job where you interact with, with people all day at a cash register or a medical clinic or, or at a grocery store and finding ways to add joy and compassion to others. For you, it might mean teaching, training, discipling your own family, your neighbors, your children, your grandchildren, showing what it looks like to be a good neighbor and a follower of Jesus, even to the point of giving of yourself. which begs the question, when was the last time you gave something up for your faith? And I'm not just talking about, about, um, about our, our offering, but giving something up. Giving and generosity can be transformational, right? It can be life-changing when we give in such a way that we are laying down our own desires and we're prioritizing the plans of God over our plans for, for our own wants. But so often, even that kind of giving is done in a quiet and, and a polite way. And so often, we take our faith and we make it polite. But taking up your cross is public and prophetic. 
It's about setting your mind on the concerns of God and then living your faith out loud so that others might see it. It means embracing the stigma because you are convinced that there is another way that this world can be and people might look at you like you've lost your mind because you are giving of yourself for a better world in keeping with the kingdom of God. It means confronting evil and injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, which is our baptismal vow. It might mean as a faith community, we rethink our resources, our space, the way we use our time and energy to carry out God's work in prophetic ways. Today, the challenge is really clear. Following Jesus means following Jesus to the cross, but not his cross, your cross. What are you being called to do? How are you being called to live transformationally in this world? And the only reason we go to the cross or we take up that cross is because our minds are settled on the concerns of God. We have set our mind on God's concerns. And so if you're ready... If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, first of all, learn the way of Jesus. Reading the Gospel of Mark, which is where today's scripture comes from, it'll take you an hour. It's 16 chapters, and they're not chapters like a book. It's like a few paragraphs is a chapter, and it's worth reading in one sitting so that you might see the complete vision of Jesus. And then I invite you, once you have set your, your mind to the concerns of God by discovering what God's concerns are. To go out into this world, to go for a walk and ask this question, God, where is my cross? Where are your concerns in my life so that I might take up this cross and follow you? Because take up your cross, Jesus says, and follow me. We are reminded that Jesus' life was not defined by the cross, but rather resurrection. There is victory over this struggle, and this cross is worth picking up. Take up your cross and follow the way of love. May it be so. And so now, as you go into your day and your week, may you be filled with the love of God, uh, loving others as Christ loves you. And so receive the benediction. May the love of God surround you. May the love of God uplift you. May the love of God stand with you through the challenges ahead. May the love of God convince you in every situation to love. And now, let us love others as Christ loves us. Amen. Go in peace, everybody. Have a beautiful week.